New York, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Spark Summit East. Brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. This is the Cube. We're here live at Spark Summit East at Midtown. At the Hilton Hotel, this is our second big data event this year. It's interesting to note it's in New York. A lot of the doers in big data are, are in New York. The Cube goes out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. Ali Gozi is here. He's the CEO of Databricks. Ali, welcome to the Cube. Thank you very much. I love when an executive stands up and just, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. You know, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And you started off saying the reason why we started the company was to simplify big data. I love that. It's a simple but defining statement. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, it was pretty simple for us. We, uh, at that time, we were all active in the Hadoop project, and what we saw is that uh, even really simple operations were extremely complicated. So, you know, if you're given, a, say, a thousand numbers, and I ask you to just compute a statistical average of those thousand numbers, you know, you put it in Excel, you click, and then you get the answer. Exactly the same simple, trivial problem, if you're asked to do that, say, on a petabyte of data, it's rocket science all of a sudden. You know, you need PhDs, uh, you need to spend a lot of money, you need to set up projects, you need to spend many, many months, and then at the end of it, you'll get that answer. Okay, the answer <laughs> is 42. You know, so um, our vision was it won't be this way. 10, 20, 30 years from now, this is, this is going to go away. It's going to become as easy, you know. So we want to be part of that journey, you know, to simplify, you know, and what it really ultimately means is that companies can extract insights more easily, it lowers their costs, and they can do great things with it. Yes, and, and you guys talk a lot about the, the training efforts that you made this year. I'm, I'm struck by the story of the early days of the automobile. People were concerned that there wouldn't be enough chauffeurs to drive around the only people who could afford the vehicle. Right. Of course, that didn't scale, so they had to make it sort of self-learning, you know, self not yeah. self-driving, self-driving <laughs> will get here. But so, in that spirit, so much data that we're absorbing as humans, we can't absorb anymore. So we need data scientists, we need trained mm -hmm. developers. Um, you can only train so many, eventually software has to take over, but right. talk about what you're doing from a training standpoint. That was one of your big learnings of this past year. Yeah, enabling people to get access directly to the data. You know, I mean, access to data sets is one, the other one is great training material. Having that available so that they don't have to go through all those, they don't need to go through those hoops of setting it up themselves, getting machines, configuring it, stitching it together. You know, it's a full-time job to just do that. And only then are you set up ready to start exploring, you know, to write your own programs and figure out, you know, ex extracting insights from your data. So you want to lower that bar and make that happen much more seamlessly. You know, you talked about early days of big data yeah. and sort of working with a pet petabyte versus what, what, you know, a thousand mm -hmm. rows in Excel becomes rocket science. Mm -hmm. um, that was a developer perspective, yeah. but we, some, we had a similar problem on the admin side where mm -hmm. Hadoop is a ecosystem, not a product. Yeah. And, you know, you're trying to, even a vendor, Doug, Doug Cutting told us it's kind of scary every time they get a new project, it's like, well, how do we manage it and we can't deprecate the old stuff? You took a very different approach. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the beauties of the cloud. In the cloud, there are a lot of different companies and they have services that they're hosting for you. They have already configured it for you. It's up and running, it's elastic. So you can compose you know, those uh, services or products that you need for your use cases uh, seamlessly or much more easily than if you had to do it on-prem. On-premises, you have to you know, get the software, it, it has to fit well, you have to make sure that you open up the security and make that work out. You know, and uh, that's, it's just a very different game than something where it's already a service up there. So oftentimes, Databricks will get uh, a customer that says, we'd also like to do this, you know, this other, you know, do you have any answer to this uh, piece of the you know, um, equation or the problem that we're trying to solve? And we might not have an answer to that, but there's a cloud provider that already has that service and will just integrate immediately with it, seamlessly. And that company will be responsible for hosting that service and configuring it and managing it, and we're responsible for ours. But you've, so you've made it, as a, as a service provider, yeah. you've made it easy to, to deliver and operate your um, services. But someone like a uh, Cloudera with mm -hmm. um, Director mm -hmm. can go up and make some assumptions about how things should be configured. But you've got another step further, which is rather than having 
you know, 30 some projects, all, each on their own release cycle, you have one, one engine. Tell us a little bit how that makes it easier from an admin's point of view. Well, first of all, we'll make sure that it's always integrated in one version. Okay. One of the, another advantage of the cloud is that we only have two versions of our software at any given time running in the whole world. You know, that is not true if you're on-premises, right? There are many right. older versions of your software running in different data centers. So For us, there is only two one versions. Behind. Yeah, there's so a current one. And N minus one are the only yeah, two versions. Exactly, okay. exactly, and we okay. move in lockstep. And we make sure that the next version that we put out is integrated and is configured and it's working out of the box. We have extensive automated testing that tries that out. So you don't have to really, it, it's a different, if, if a completely different play. We also release every week. So a new release goes up every week and you know, then it's pushed out. So uh, you know, in a two week period, customers will see that version that you're working on. So that's also a completely different model. Um, whereas actually with open source Spark, which is also used in non-cloud settings, those releases happen on three month or you know, six month you know, longer uh, horizons. Uh, that's a different uh, play. Uh, your projects tend to be much more cyclical. You do development, then you freeze the code, then there's a QA period, documentation period, and it sort of goes like this. Uh, with the cloud service, it's not like that. It's uh, continuously developing features and deploying them to customers. And from the, from the customer standpoint, that integrated package is so attractive. You mentioned today, you, if your platform that you not launched, launched last summer comes with open source Spark, uh, SQL, machine learning, uh, uh, other components, yep. you know, as well as the core, core yep. platform. So essentially you can deploy that yep. at software-like marginal economics. So right. you, the repeatability right. is there, so that simplifies you know, the, the customer's world dramatically. And obviously, from your standpoint, right. it's a better business model. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit, what the customer impact you've seen there. Yeah, so first of all, there is this line of what goes in open source and what doesn't for Databricks. Mm -hmm. uh, Databricks, I think we've developed about a million lines of code of you know, software that is part of the cloud um, offering that we have. That's not part of the open source. And then there's open source Spark, which I think is roughly 250,000 lines of code these days. Um, so that's one of the things that we were very excited about when we started Databricks, to figure out how do you draw that line between open source, open source companies, which pieces should be proprietary, which pieces should be open source. A lot of companies struggle with that. Uh, you know, how do you, and how do you monetize that? And we had an answer that we were very happy about. So for us, the line is the things that you run in, on our service, on top of Spark, on the execution engine, that, we don't want to lock you in on that. So if you can run it there, you should be able to pull that out and run on any other Spark service that's anywhere else. And we have certifications for Spark that Databricks provides that actually ensures that it runs well on those other distros or other places. Um, so that's really important. Uh, but things like integrations, security, or things that speed it up or work really well out of the box in certain environments, um, that's really important to enterprises and uh, that doesn't necessarily need to be in the open source. Okay, so that's how you will define your competitive advantage yeah. go, going forward, and, yep. and that's your business model. Yeah, and you know, if you look, and we've been true to this, so um, SQL, for instance, was, is part of uh, Spark now. Uh, we actually developed it at Databricks after we founded the company. We developed SQL, it was not part of Spark originally, and we committed it back to open source. Uh, and, and it was an excellent decision, looking back now because we want to make sure that you know, anyone who can run on the Spark open source platform should be able to run it also you know, in other environments than the Databricks hosted one. So how, let's talk about, back up a little bit, or yes. hit the escape key on how customers are sort of applying your technology. You know, I was saying to George, in the early days, we were here at this hotel in the early days of Hadoop world, and it yeah. was pig and hive and scoop and flume and all yeah. kinds <laughs> of geeky stuff, and right. a, a lot of that going on yeah. here as well. Let's take it to the business impact. So you want to, goal is to simplify big data, AKA simplify Hadoop. Mm -hmm. um, people attacked the storage container problem mm -hmm. with Hadoop. Yeah. Um, and because the, uh, number one, number two is the whole data warehouse, business intelligence business never lived up to its promise. Mm -hmm. So now big data analytics puts forth this big promise, which so far Hadoop has not lived up to, except for the first piece. Mm -hmm. reducing my investment mm -hmm. in the denominator. What does Spark bring to solving those business problems? Well, it provides, so companies don't care about the technology per se. Right. They have a problem they want to solve. So they're looking for a solution to their problem. So they have a use case, they want to, you know, they have a project around that, they have an initiative or a platform they want to deploy. Uh, for them, 
that problem that they're attacking has many different pieces. A small portion of that might be one of these technologies that you mentioned, one of those you know, three-letter acronyms or one of those. And so they're not really focused on that. So one of the visions of Spark and what we, what we provide has all along been, how can we give them something that works end-to-end? -end? So it's turnkey. Rather than having to stitch together different pieces, how do we do that? And that was actually one of the visions of the Spark project from the very, very early days. We used to use the term unifying. So it unifies different use cases. So if I take a step back, look at Spark, when we developed Spark, there were really two separate problems we wanted to attack. One was that companies had already now stored their data in either data warehouses or maybe in data lakes or enterprise data hubs or in Hadoops, and more and more these days also in the cloud. But the data was siloed, and they couldn't make decisions on it. So that was one problem. And as part of that, the data that they had, had you know, was sometimes unstructured, sometimes it was semi-structured. So it was coming in in different forms, especially now with IoT devices exploding. You know, you're getting, collecting a lot of data from different environments and sensors. So how do you work with all those data sets? So it was not just the scale, it was also the variety that you saw. And then there was this integration problem. So many companies would have the siloed data sets and they couldn't work with it. So we wanted to unify those. How can we give you access to all of them in a really efficient manner? That was one, so you can make decisions on your data that you have. The second was unifying the use cases that companies had. And what we saw is that, yes, they want to have a SQL or a, you know, a, a SQL engine that they can run BI on top of. Yeah, absolutely, they want to do that. But they also want to go further. There are also advanced analytics use cases that they want to do, which the traditional software does not give them. They want to be able to do for forecasting. They want to be able to do anomaly detection. Uh, they want to be able to uh, cluster or segment the data that they have based on features they've seen. I mean, this is the dawn of AI, right? Strong AI. You, you mentioned self-driving cars. There is Siri. There is Watson. So the, every company also wants to hit these use cases. And then finally, the last one is real time. They want to also do all of what I said in real time on recent data, not just on you know, a month data from a month ago or a week ago. Those so we unify these. Yeah, so it's unifying these is where you provide value to the customer. So not having the siloed data and being able to unify the use cases that they have so they can end-to-end -end build pipelines that solve the problems or give them the turnkey solutions that they need. Okay, so the silo busting yeah. you know, adds value. It yes. Also, there's a simplification component yeah. there, uh, unifying the use cases in, in real time. I wonder if you could comment on a broader theme that we've mm -hmm. been discussing, which is you know, for the past decade plus, information has become you know, widely available to consumers. Yes. Yes. So we, the, the pricing power has shifted from the brands to the consumers. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like a lot of the big data initiatives are ways in which brands can begin to develop proprietary data that they can act on to, to regain some power in the marketplace mm -hmm. relative to their competition as a business opportunity. Do you see that? I mean, is that a fair assertion on our part in terms of observing that, that pricing power sort of has moderated that asymmetry where the brands had the yeah. advantage, and now it's the brands trying to get that advantage back. Is that actually happening? Well, I think uh, the way I would see it is that data has become democratized. So, you know, companies, you know, it, you have to keep the companies honest. The value that they provide has to match the price that they charge. And that's what's happening. With so many offerings and with so much comparison points, uh, you know, companies can now much more easily compare and see and make sure that they're actually paying for the value that they're getting. I think that's good for everyone. Um, it is, but now if you look at Amazon and yeah. Google and Netflix, they seem to be creating a new advantage for themselves, which is they know more about me than I know about me. Mm -hmm. They know when I'm ready to buy, they know when I've run out of you know, paper towels, and yeah. But that's providing value for you, right? That's They're, valuable that's, that's, to that's, me, that's, oh, absolutely. That's the but the value comes from creating some proprietary knowledge about me that I don't even have. Because so, they can silo bust in a way that you can't yes, as and a so, consumer. Yes, so, so, so there's value creation. Yeah. It's a little scary, yeah. maybe sometimes, but yeah. that seems to us to be the big opportunity right. for businesses who right. really do a good job in this space. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're figuring out what you need, right? So you uh, buy before that you premise. even know that. Yeah, you, okay. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we have to also be careful that, you know, uh, you know, but if it's, as long as it's machines that are looking over the data sets, there's not someone reading your data, sitting there and, you know, and, uh, and you know, they're doing it to help you, um, you know, I think, I think that's, well, that's value. Of course, if it can go wrong, so you have to That's be another big theme. I mean, yeah. you know, six, seven years ago at, at this, these events, yeah. we were talking about, you know, humans, can you take humans out of the equation? Yeah. And, the, and the theme was always, no, no, 
humans are that last mile, like the old I cable. Yeah. Um, is that changing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unclear how much, you know, I mean, we're definitely automating more and more and more. It's unclear how much humans will be needed. The line keeps moving, though, doesn't yeah, it? I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the more you can automate, the better. Yeah, I mean, no, the better it will be. I mean, it, does, yeah. it doesn't mean that it's going to be bad for those people that don't, you know, cannot do those jobs. It just means, it is. you know. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure, actually. No, no, I mean, I'm saying yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's, uh, more importantly, the resources on the planet is the same. So this just means we have more time to do you know, other things. You know, maybe we don't need to have someone that does that really mundane task. They can focus instead on well, things. Well, and that's kind of what you guys yeah. are doing, right? Yeah. When you simplify big data, yeah. you're freeing up people to do yeah. more, not to fire people, yeah. but to freeing people to do it now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> people may lose jobs, who knows, but the other jobs will be created, hopefully. Right? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. You said something interesting about beyond busting the silos uh -huh. of yeah. the different data yes. sets and data structures. Yes but the use cases themselves. Um, SQL, machine learning and its variants, um, and real time. Real time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, those can encompass larger and larger sort of surface areas. Yeah. Where are you being taken by your customers in, in what order to push back those boundaries that are there now? I see. Um, I mean, what we're seeing really strong, especially this year more recently, is a push for real time. It, it seems, it, it was different a year or two ago. Uh, a year or two ago, there was a lot of advanced analytics use cases that companies had, in addition to traditional use cases. Now, this year, we're seeing that you know, the, all three are now being combined. So you set up processes where you break those silos, and for that, you need something that can work across these different storage systems and formats. And once you've done that, you have your data in a format that can now, uh, you can leverage it and start doing more analytics on it, and maybe more advanced analytics. And then now, companies also want to do that in real time. So that's a strong use case that's coming. So basically bringing transaction and analytic systems together to affect an outcome in near real time anyway. Yes, yes. So that you can gain market share yes. or, or maybe save a life. Yes, yes, or, exactly. Or, By the way, that's, you said near real time. That's, that's a good point. You know, when we ask customers, what is your actual re requirements? What is really the requirements? Oftentimes you, you hear this thing that I call human real time. It, fast enough so I can react to it. If it's a millisecond or 100 milliseconds, I don't really care. But I don't want to work on half an hour or two hour old data. Yeah, we um, define real time as before you lose the customer. Yes. I mean, <laughs> however, whatever time frame that right, is. Right, right, know. yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's shrinking, it's I guess, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, uh, I didn't ask you about your thoughts on, on Spark Summit and the growth. You showed some uh, er, earlier, uh, Mate, uh, uh, you guys showed some, Matej, yeah. Zaharia showed some growth charts, mm -hmm. which was quite interesting. Yes. You got to be thrilled. Yeah, um, very excited, yeah. Talk about this event, its, it's global nature, yeah. you know, what's, what's coming next? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of, there's a lot of developers that come to this conference. We'd like to keep it that way. Uh, in the future, we might separate it out more cl uh, clearly. With, with tracks or with a different conference? Uh, it'll be the same conference, but there'll be, we'll delineate it more. You know, uh, otherwise, you face this challenge of you know, having two split audiences that you want to you know, cater to at the same time. We want to definitely keep the developer focus. So a lot of the developers come here, I think 70, 80% when we survey them are, have some kind of uh, background. They're sort of developers. Uh, we want to still keep them engaged. Many of them, when we surveyed in, why are you here? One of the main reasons to say is we want to see where the future will be in big data. You know, we're here to see, you know, sort of. So we want to keep that, have exciting talks for them. Uh, you know, I mean, we're indebted to this community. Uh, we're <laughs> extremely thankful. It's not uh, going to be easy. So, yeah. I mean, I remember Hadoop World 2009, 2010, yeah. it was that same community, but the demand was overwhelming yes. from, from the business community. Yeah. So, but your commitment is to try to preserve that Absolutely. flavor. And Absolutely. then what, service the business community with a different uh, sort of we, we could have tra We could have tracks, and there are actually events that for Spark Summit West, there might be some different uh, way we organize this so that we can have clear delineation, and those that are interested in the business uh, prospect, they can go there and watch those talks and the keynotes from industry leaders. And then on the developer side, there'll be you know, exciting developer talks like the ones you saw from Matei today. Well, we saw you know, the early days, George, you really you know, pushed us to get into the whole Spark community. Right. So we appreciate, Ali, you guys having us here, and giving us this great space, and thank you for coming on theCUBE. Thank Cube. you, it's our pleasure. Thank you. All right, keep right there, everybody. Everybody, we'll be back right after this. This is uh, theCUBE, we're live from Spark Summit East. Be right back. <laughs>